Hi, so before we begin, I just wanted to give a little lowdown of what this upload is. Um, so basically, for those who don't know, I've started doing some more short-form informational vocal synth videos, and they are primarily over on my all-new TikTok, insert here, and um, I was initially planning on doing like a simul release system where it's like, oh, I release something on TikTok, and then I can very easily release it on YouTube by just putting it up on YouTube Shorts. But the thing is that YouTube Shorts has a length limit and TikTok has a significantly larger one. So I wasn't able to do that when this video actually came out, when these two parts actually came out. So basically, if you see this as a regular upload and you're like, shouldn't this be a short? That's because it's too fucking long. Um, so yeah, uh, all that stuff's gonna be on my TikTok and then I might still put the longer ones on here anyway as videos, but I don't know, you tell me. Hi, in the past I've uploaded two different videos across the internet that deal with the distinctions between sample-based concatenative vocal sense and vocal sense that were made with AI. And in both cases, there was a demand for more info in two areas. One, if AI voice banks have a severe environmental impact, and two, how consent works in the context of AI synthesis. My name is Joey, and this is my short-form informational series on Vocaloid and the vocal synth scene. So the fact is, despite the info I've been passing on in my vSynth videos, I'm not personally at liberty to give definite yes or no answers about what you should and should not endorse, because I'm not at liberty to, even when there are clear examples. I'm just a consumer, like everyone else, and I can be wrong almost all of the time, so I can only pass on two things. The info I know from third parties, which can be proven or disproven later in life, and base fundamentals on how I feel best to approach a discussion like this. We'll be starting with environmental impact, because believe it or not, that's actually the quickest subject to broadly outline. Now, this borders on pedantry, but I promise it's a distinction that matters. But technically, in big capital letters, it's not generative AI as a standalone concept that has a severe harm on the environment. And this is another symptom of generative AI becoming misconstrued into this magic word for thing I don't like, which discourages people from engaging with the subject and learning more about it. What actually harms the environment is the external systems that result from some but not all of the generative AI tools that have cropped up over the years, and their subsequent demand, which makes that impact more damning, because it means that AI technology has the ability to be sustainable and ethical, but the companies in charge are just simply choosing not to do so. The reason ChatGPT is a commonly cited example is not because a language model is fundamentally harmful, it's because a language model that is built to rely on massive data centers in order to constantly retrain and adapt itself over and over while still being readily available to a general audience of end users is what's directly harmful. ChatGPT's image is a perfect microcosm of climate denialism as a whole, where we're told that individual use cases harm the environment and that harm is an inevitability, when in reality it stems from the those in power allowing us to make those individual use cases to begin with. So if we were to extend this metaphor, putting a prompt into ChatGPT is like pulling a plastic straw. You ideally shouldn't, but in the grand scheme, there's an energy company that's burning fossil fuels at a higher rate than you ever will in your entire lifetime. If you've ever read an article that says ChatGPT consumes this many resources with every prompt, that's a gross value divided across its usage statistics. It's not literally saying that that you dried up a reservoir by pressing enter. So where does vocal synthesis come into all of this? Well, it is factually accurate in the broadest way possible to say that developing an AI vocal synth consumes power and resources, but it consumes just as much as any other software being developed, and once that development is finished, they stop iterating on the product because it's done, it's ready for release, and then it's operated entirely from your system's hardware. So from a consumption standpoint, while AI vocal synth engines are generally more demanding of your hardware than concatenative engines, the difference in the grand scheme is ultimately negligible. It's like the difference between playing two video games with two different spec requirements. So to conclude this half, it's good that we're more vigilant of the environmental impacts of generative AI, and we should hold tech companies accountable, but the important part of that sentiment that got lost along the way is an understanding of what that impact is, and the instances where that impact is not present. And if we want to commentate on and criticise AI, the trick isn't to out right reject and be afraid of it, but to engage on its terms so you can make informed decisions. I changed my outfit because I was told wearing the same outfit twice on social media is like some cardinal sin or whatever.
whatever. So this brings us to consent in vocal synthesis, which, believe it or not, is way more complicated than environmental impact, because it's more hypothetical and it's more of a case-by-case -case basis. One of the easiest errors to fall into when discussing consent in vocal synthesis is the idea that consent is an infallible binary choice, that you either consent or you don't consent, and if you did, that therefore means that everything that happens afterwards is completely fine, but we'll elaborate on that in a bit. There are some pretty straightforward ways to determine the level of consent that's provided in a vocal synth project, one clear way being if the voice provider is visibly credited in the release of the voice bank, and bonus points if they're shown actively participating in vocal synth culture and its audience. But all of that said, if a voice provider has not been publicly revealed, that is not necessarily indicative of anything dubious. Sometimes you make the call for one personal reason or another, and that is equally worthy of respect, sometimes it's just a professional boundary. So another approach is assessing at the company level. How outspoken is a vocal synth developer about their approach to ethics, and what are some of their publicly known efforts and associations? For example, Eclipse Sounds, makers of banks such as Solaria and Havoc, have not only spoken publicly about ethics being at the forefront of their operation, but confirm that their voice providers receive royalties from software sales. And on top of that, their voice providers are given a sufficient rundown of what the release entails, allowing them to act accordingly with the community. But like I said, consent is not infallible. There's a term I use a lot when talking about vocal sense, and that is informed consent. I want to state now that I use the term rather crudely because it has a medical origin, but it's easily one of the best descriptors for this concept. Simply put, saying yes is one thing, but it's another thing to receive a sufficient amount of information on what the hell is going on so you don't get blindsided later after you said yes. And we do have instances in the industry of voice providers who took on the project, but were not given an entire lowdown of what the project was. This example is currently inconclusive at this time, but for those who don't know, the previously undisclosed voice provider for Korean Voice Bank Uni, Jung and Lee, filed an injunction suspending sales of Uni's AI voice bank for Synthesizer V Studio 2. The reason being, according to Lee's account of the events, was that even though she said yes to doing a new voice bank for Uni and was informed that vocal synths have started using AI, the parent company ST Media did not give a sufficient explanation of how much vocal synthesis had improved since the older Vocaloid engine she originally lent her voice to, was not given any preview of the voice bank until it was already announced and set for release, and was not informed that this new bank would sound exactly like her point for point, so sometimes there are little grey areas like that. But if we want to get even greyer, we need only look beyond the voice banks themselves and look at the engines as a whole. We know that the models for individual singers come from a single voice provider, but in order for all of this to work, the engine itself needed to be trained from an expanded data set beyond just the voice banks. The reason AI allows for features such as the ability for voice banks to sing in multiple languages and dialects beyond what the original model allows is because there's a global data set of vocal traits for them to borrow in real time. So this one is a bit more elusive and falls into private trade secrets depending on the party, but the subject of consent doesn't just stop at the vocals themselves, and even extends to how was the engine itself developed. For example, Expressive Labs, creators of Mikoto Studio, have an ethics page on their site that details their usage of AI technology, including an up-to-date list of every data set that goes into the software's own development, not just the voice banks. Like I alluded to at the start, my goal with these types of videos isn't to give you definitive rules to follow about vocal synthesis, it's just to elaborate further on very common talking points in the hope that it allows everyone to inform their perspectives further, and even inform how they would like industry entities to conduct themselves to their audience. Like, if you disagree with me, or worse yet, I got something objectively wrong, cool, that's what I want. <laughs> because I don't see the debate as AI versus anti-AI, I see it as information versus misinformation, and I want to encourage more curiosity. Generative AI harms the environment? Okay, how does it do that? Vocaloids can use AI? Okay, cool, how can can they? This bank was made with consent? Okay, what kind of consent? But to be clear, I'm not saying this means you should feel required to do your homework on everything that you interact with, because that's not realistic, and none of this information was stuff that I learned from day one of being in this community. If you're writing a comment asking me to lay out what vocal synth entities you should and should not support, or asking what about X, what about Y, I simply cannot do that because I'm not an authority on that beyond my own beliefs. But what you should should be is vigilant to new information and willing to adjust and refine your stance accordingly. It's not what you know that matters or even what you used to believe. 
it's how you react when you're informed about something you don't know. Despite what this online environment tells you, it is okay to live life making mistakes so long as you're correcting them afterwards and seeking to make your community a kinder, more informed space to be in. And my heart goes out to anyone who thinks this is overly complicated and just wanted to listen to some music, but the fact is, this niche art form is part of a very real tech movement that is impacting the real world, and I see it as a moral obligation to keep informed. I think as a fandom, we need to continue having silly internet slap fights about AI. The main reason I wanted to learn more about AI synthesis is because I'm friends with so many creatives, from musicians to illustrators to actors who can and have received tangible harm by unmoderated and deceptive AI usage. So I'm not participating in all of this just so I can find that get out of jail free card that allows me to enjoy Miku guilt free. I'm doing this because it feels right, and it's interesting, and hopefully Hopefully one day we can draw a fine line that makes everyone happy in the end. And this is my silly little futile effort in that pursuit.